Thank you for joining with us this evening. Let's begin with a song, At Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not he was for me, he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied. Lord, we thank you for this evening that we can gather together again this way. We ask, Lord, that you would move amongst us and even those who are watching and that you would minister to each and every one of our hearts and that glory would be brought unto thee. So help us now and bless. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue with a song, Yield Not to Temptation. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you, another to win. Fight manfully onward.
joining with us tonight and those here in the auditorium. Thank you for being here. We do want to mention that uh, we will continue to live stream Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Also, if you're a member of the church or you feel part of this local church ministry, you can send your tithes and your offerings and your missions giving to First Baptist Church, 235 High Street, Perth Amboy, New Jersey, Attention Financial Secretary, 08861. Also, there's an offering plate on the organ if uh, some choose to just place their offering uh, in the offering plate there, it will get to our financial secretary. We're going to have another song, and then we'll have a special, and then we'll look into God's Word this evening. Right now, let's sing, The Old Account Was Settled. There was a time on earth when in the book of heaven an old account was standing for sins yet unforgiven. My name was at the top and many things below. I went unto the keeper and settled long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account I said a long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. And the record's clear today. Glory washed my sins away. When the old account was settled long ago. And in that happy home, my Savior's home above, I'll sing redemption story. And praise him for his love. I'll not forget that book with pages white as snow. Because I came and settled and settled long ago, long ago. Trust the Lord, be cleansed of all your sin, for thus he hath provided for you to enter in. And then if you should live a hundred years below, up there you'll not regret it. You said oh, long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. Clear today, for he washed my sins away when the old account was settled long ago. for me its fountain is wide as the sea there's room at the cross for you yes there's room at the cross for you the millions have come to the Lord The 
have found him a friend and have turned from the sins they have sinned. The Savior still waits to open the gates, welcomes a sinner before it's too late. There's room at the cross. Let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'm going to begin reading in verse number 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 4. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ that in everything ye are enriched by him and in all, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Watch again verse number 7. The Bible says, so that ye come behind in no gift. Now I want to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? And let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the scriptures. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would take the word of God and minister to each and every one of our hearts. May our hearts be open to what you have for us. And let us not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. 
Fill me with thy spirit for the teaching and preaching now of thy word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 7, and for a reason, because also 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, these two portions of scripture tie together in the message that I want to bring forth tonight. The Apostle Paul is speaking to these Christians, these saved people in the city of Corinth. And he says to them, ye come behind in no spiritual gift. Ye come behind in no spiritual gift. Yet in the same epistle written at the same time, he said, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Now, in the first statement, he told them that they came behind in no spiritual gift. And then he said, you're not spiritual, you're still carnal. Today, in our Bible-believing churches, we have many people who are gifted. But the tragedy is that though they have spiritual gifts to display, they're not spiritual. Instead, they're carnal, operating in the energy of the flesh. So there's a difference between spiritual gifts and spirituality. And the Apostle Paul made the contrast when he wrote to these Corinthian believers. Now, the truth is, churches of our day have become more like the Corinthian church than any other church mentioned in the New Testament. We have the display in various Bible-believing churches of spiritual gifts. Many may be saved, but yet those very saved people are yet carnal. Many are gifted by God, but are not operating by the power of God. A spiritual gift or gifts are visible to men, but true spirituality is visible only to God. You don't know if I'm spiritual. You can hear me preach. Uh, you can know some things about me, uh, but you don't really know what's inside. You don't really know my heart. You don't know if I'm spiritual or not. You can tell by how I preach or how someone sings or how someone wins souls. I'm saying you can see some things that these people do and that I'm doing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm spiritual. That doesn't mean that those people doing those things, singing or winning souls, are spiritual. There are many uh, in our churches who will shout, praise the Lord, and we want that to be done if that's coming from your heart. And people who say amen, and we appreciate that uh, uh, when the word of God is preached. But uh, just someone, because someone says hallelujah or praise the Lord, that doesn't mean uh, they're spiritual. Now, if you have your Bibles, you, you can listen to me and those uh, watching live streaming, of course, the verses will appear before you and so it makes it easier on you. But if anybody here would like to turn, I'll read it to you. 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses six and seven, God very clearly tells us that a spiritual gift or gifts may be visible to men, but our spirituality is visible only to God. The prophet Samuel came looking for God's choice to be anointed as the next king of the nation of Israel. The Bible says, and it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab. Now, uh, we know that, that, uh, that David had several 
brothers. In fact, uh, uh, he seemed to be the youngest. And when Samuel met Jesse's sons, David's father, he said, as he looked upon Eliab, it must be this big, tall, handsome fella. Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. That's what Samuel said of Eliab, the oldest brother of David. Now, why did Samuel say that? Because of Eliab's appearance. Maybe he was a gifted speaker. Maybe Eliab had an appealing personality. Something about Eliab convinced this old prophet of God that he must be God's choice. He said, this must be the one. But what Samuel saw on the outside didn't match what God saw on the inside. So the Lord said to Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Now, many people use that verse and twist it to say something else. That verse is not teaching that God does not care about the outside of one of his children. Because God is concerned. God does care how his children appear and look. Many verses in the Bible teach that God is concerned about a how, how a serve per, saved person looks and how a saved person dresses. The Bible teaches in the Old Testament, it talks about the uh, apparel uh, of a harlot, the dress of a harlot. Uh, the, the harlot in the Old Testament was identified by the way she dressed. Uh, the Bible says a whole lot of other things concerning the outward appearance of God's people. But what he's saying here is that man can only see the outside. Man can only see the visible. Man can only see somebody's stature. Man can only observe someone's personality or his oratory, or his gifts, or his talents, or his abilities. Man can do that, but God looks on the heart. God can see the heart. I'm saying that many people could even look on the outside of a saved person who is dressed properly according to the word of God and say, wow, they're spiritual. But again, God looks on the heart. You can uh, look, look like a great Christian, but that doesn't mean uh, you're spiritual. Again, this isn't teaching that God isn't concerned with the outside because God is concerned with the outside. But God says, I choose somebody not because of what they look like outwardly and how gifted they are, that's how man chooses somebody, by the outward appearance. But God says, I choose them because of what they are on the inside. So God's not saying that the outside doesn't matter. He's simply saying that man can't see the inside. God's saying that he's the only one who can see, see uh, deep, into uh, the heart of an individual. God's saying that he chooses people based on what they are on the inside, not based on how gifted they are or how talented they are on the outside or what they look like to man. Now, remember, when God rejected Saul and said, I have chosen your neighbor who is better than you. He was talking about quality. He was talking about David being a man after God's own heart. 
He was talking not about David's abilities, but about David's devotion to God. He was not talking about what David could do, but about what David was. That's what made David better than what Saul was. Samuel, as godly a man as he was, wouldn't have chosen David over Eliab because he could only make a decision based on what he saw outwardly, evidently. I'm saying simply that spiritual gifts are visible to man, but true spirituality cannot be seen by man. It can only be seen by God. Gifts have to do with delivery. Spirituality has to do with devotion to the person of God. Let's take Moses for an example. Moses, as many of you know, studying the Bible, Moses was not a gifted speaker. As a matter of fact, he complained to God in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. He said, oh my Lord, I am not eloquent. Moses certainly was not unintelligent. He was educated in all the wisdom of Egypt, but he was not a gifted speaker. And although he was not eloquent in his speech, he's spoken of no less than 18 times in the book of Joshua as Moses, my servant, and Moses, the servant of the Lord. Moses was not a gifted speaker, but he was devoted to God. God used Moses' brother Aaron as the gifted speaker. Moses was the one who was the most likely uh, uh, to, <clears throat> to be used of God, uh, but Aaron was the one who was most gifted. Aaron had a better delivery, but Moses was more godly. And therefore, God had a closer relationship with Moses and Moses to God than Aaron to God. What about the Apostle Peter? The Apostle Peter was the most gifted of the 12. He had the most dynamic personality and was the strongest leader. That's pretty evident in John chapter 21 where, uh, where, where Peter said, I go a fishing. And the others said, we also go with thee. In other words, they followed Peter. Peter was the leader. Peter was the one who was the most dynamic speaker. He was the strongest leader amongst them. But John was the one that leaned on the bosom of Jesus. John had the closest relationship to Christ. John was the most devoted of the 12. Peter was the most dynamic of the 12. And that made Peter, since he was the strongest personality, that made him the leader of the group. So, considering what I just pointed out, how do you think it works? Do you think the most spiritual person influences the strongest personality, or does the strongest personality affect the more spiritual person? You want another example? The Bible tells us that they toiled all night and caught nothing. In the morning, Jesus was over on the shore and yelled over to them while they were in the boats, children, have you any meat? Have you any food? Who was it that recognized Jesus? It was John, the one that leaned on Jesus' bosom, the one that knew him most intimately. It was John. It was John who said, it's the Lord. It is John who recognized Jesus first. So, wasn't John more spiritual than Peter? 
How come then John was following Peter in his backsliding? How is it then when Peter said, I'm quitting, I'm going back to fishing? Why did John join in with him and follow Peter when John was the more spiritual? Peter said, I quit. I'm going back to my fishing business. Peter was the gifted one. He had the dynamic personality. He had the personality that drew people to him as a leader. Peter was the one who had the strongest leadership qualities. But Peter was not careful about being spiritual in his leadership. The most gifted person affected the most spiritual person. Understand that. The most gifted person affected the most spiritual person. The strongest personality affected the most spiritual Christian, and not for good. You say, well, what's the point you're trying to make? Here's the point. The gifts have to do with dynamics, but spirituality has to do with unction from God. The word unction means an anointing. God wants to anoint his children for service. He wants to put something special in him, in them, his power. There's a difference between a fella who's only gifted and dynamic and a fella who has the unction of God upon him. There's a difference between knowing the chemistry of the working of people as opposed to being yielded to the Holy Ghost with an anointing from God upon you. What's happened is that we've replaced today in our day and in our churches the unction of God with the dynamics of an individual or the spiritual gifts of an individual. We have many gifted people today, again, in our Bible-believing churches, but I believe we desperately need to have spirit spirituality as well as being gifted. What good is the gift if the gift is not backed up and in the unction and power of Almighty God? In Acts chapter 24, beginning in verse 1, we read of a man who is referred to as an orator. His name is Tertullus. It says in Acts 24, 1, a certain orator named Tertullus. Verse 2, Acts 24, verse 2 says, And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, the apostle Paul, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. You see, he is called by the Jews to bear witness against the Apostle Paul. And he's speaking to Felix. He came to bear witness against the Apostle Paul before Felix. Now, Tertullus, again, the Bible says, is an orator. An orator is one who is an eloquent public speaker, somebody who knows how to captivate the crowd, someone who knows how to work on the emotions of a crowd. Now, I'm not against emotion. Thank God for emotion. God made us emotional for a reason. It's okay to cry sometimes. It's okay to get excited about the right things. But it's a better thing when God is the source of those emotions. When they stood before the king, Tertullus was the orator. 
a gifted, accomplished speaker. But the Apostle Paul was the guy who had the unction of God upon him. Tertullus made his speech and used all of his oratory skills and worked on the king and worked on the crowd. But hear what happened when the Apostle Paul got up in Acts chapter 24, verse 25, and reasoned with Felix. Acts 24, 25 says, And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. You note that? Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. The Bible says that then Felix trembled. The words, the, the words, excuse me, of the Apostle Paul put fear, the fear of God in Felix. Why? Because this wasn't working the crowd. This wasn't appealing to the crowd in the power of the flesh. But instead, it was the unction of the Holy Ghost of God upon the Apostle Paul. That's what made the difference. God dealt with the heart of that wicked king. But if I'm the one producing the results, they aren't going to last or remain. The world has already seen what we can do, which isn't much. This world doesn't need to see what we can do. This world needs to see what God can do through his people. The Apostle Paul described himself in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 6, as rude in speech. But though I be rude in speech, that's what the Apostle Paul said of himself. Then in 1 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul gave a contrast. In verse 1, he said, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech. The Apostle Paul said, I didn't come as a gifted speaker. But then in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul contrasts the dynamics of man to having the unction of the Spirit of God. Here he contrasts gifts with spirituality. He says, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We have too many professing Christians today relying on dynamics and the wisdom of men rather than on the power of God. Many are more interested in impressing people than having the power of God upon their lives. Too much of our ministering displays our gift instead of displaying our God and the power of our God. The Apostle Paul did not want them attracted to his gift, but to the giver of the gift. If God gifted you, it's no shame for you to use that gift that God gave you for his glory. God desires that, but it's a shame for us to do it in the flesh. If we use our spiritual gift in the energy of our flesh, we're going to exalt our gift instead of our God which means that men are going to rely upon our delivery instead upon God's power, which then means we will move them with what we can do instead of them being moved by God himself. Here's the bottom line. Gifts have to do with our work, but spirituality has to do with our walk. Our gifts are displayed in the work, but our true spirituality is not seen in the work. 
we can observe whatever God's uh, uh, gifted us to do. But gifts, again, have to do with work. Spirituality has to do with our walk with God. Again, many saved people have all the tools. They impress others with their gift or gifts, but they're not plugged into the power. What good is the gift if there's no power behind the gift? You can purchase the best vacuum cleaner ever made. It could be an Oric Deluxe model. It may look very impressive. And you can bring it up here on this platform and you can push it around for hours. But if you don't plug it into the receptacle, the carpet will be as dirty when you get done as it was when you first started. I don't care how good a vacuum cleaner it may be. If it's not connected to the power source, it won't get the job done, no matter how impressive it looks. And I'm afraid we have the best of everything as far as the outward show, but no power of God, no unction from God. And that ought to shame us as God's people. I'm more interested, and I hope you are, in having the power of God upon my life than just impressing somebody with something that I may do or say. To God be the glory. We believe in walking with God. It's just that we don't do it. Everyone here tonight would agree with me that it's important that we walk with God. But why don't we do it? Walking with God is best summed up in Proverbs 3, verse 5. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. God made me first for worship, and second comes the work. Yes, I'm supposed to serve God, but I'm supposed to have a walk while I work. Gifts have to do with what I do. Spirituality has to do with what I am. My gifts have to do with what I do. It has to do with my abilities. My spirituality, though, has to do with my substance, what I'm made of, what I really am on the inside. Gifts have to do with output and production. Spirituality has to do with input and the Spirit of God working upon our lives. What I am is far more important than what I do. But if I'm what I'm supposed to be, I'll do what I'm supposed to do. If I'm what I'm supposed to be, I will produce, but production is not spirituality. Our country is in sad shape today because of carnal Christianity that is highly gifted, but every bit as carnal as it is gifted. So there's a big difference between spiritual gifts talents and abilities, and spirituality. And God help us to know the difference. May God help us to desire to be spiritual than more than anything else, because after we're spiritual, then everything else good will follow. We need to have a walk with God. If you're here tonight or you're watching uh, live through live stream, if you're saved and very gifted, give God the glory. Thank God for it. Use your gift and gifts for the Lord, but don't use it in the flesh. Don't use it for a show. Don't use it 
to impress others and bring attention to yourself. Don't be like the Corinthians that come behind in no spiritual gift, but are yet carnal. So let's practice getting alone with God and cultivating a relationship and communion and walk with God. Let's love Him. Let's worship Him. Let's talk to Him. Let's obey Him. Let's concentrate on building a real relationship between us and the Lord and allow Him to use those spiritual gifts in our lives to glorify Him and to accomplish His will and purpose. Then someday, if that be true, I believe we'll hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. No matter how gifted or how talented you may be, God cannot use you and cannot use me until the person is first saved. I thank God that I've gotten saved. And I know most of you, if not all of you, in the auditorium tonight are saved. Thank God for that. But not only that, uh, God wants to use us. And that means we must operate in his power. That means we need to walk with God. And that ought to be the priority in every life of every saved child of God, walking in fellowship with God. Now, again, no matter how gifted or talented a person may be, God cannot use that person until they're saved. They must get saved. They cannot have the power of God upon them, them as I described tonight, if they're not saved. And not only that, salvation will keep a person out of eternal hell. We're all sinners, every one of us. The penalty is the lake of fire, but the good news is Jesus paid it all. All you have to do is understand that and believe on Jesus Christ. Open the door of your heart and let him come in to be the one, the one you're depending on to be forgiven and go to heaven when you die. Ask him to save you. And if you're sincere, he will save you. But then, those of us who are saved, again, are we walking in fellowship with God? That's the most important priority. That is the priority for every saved person, walking in fellowship with God. That's more important than your job. That's more important uh, than, than what you eat. It's more important than uh, your family. Because see, when we're walking with God, everything else comes together. And God does what we cannot do. The power is walking with God. That's God's will for his children. And maybe tonight, someone here or listening, watching, maybe someone needs to do something about their walk with God now that they're saved. Those who are not saved maybe need to do something now about opening the door of their heart and letting Jesus in. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for the word of God, and I pray that you would use it to uh, get a hold of hearts, help those of us who are saved to realize that no matter how talented or gifted we may be, what's more important is that we walk with God. And then may those who are unsaved call upon the Lord and be born again and be brought into the family of God through the new birth. Bless the invitation. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after Well, I am waiting, yield 